Well, hello, my people. Today, we're going to be looking at a prophecy of doom that could spell the end of the modding community as we know it in the months to come. But first, let's get to the news news. If you haven't seen the first episode of this pay for mod saga, just for context purposes, go ahead and click the little exclamation point up in the corner of the video, and you'll be able to watch it really quick before watching this one. So in the first tidbit of news, this whole pay for mod saga has claimed its first victim. Yes, the author of Frostfall, Belt Fastened Quivers, and my personal favorite, Wearable Lanterns. As far as we know, and we're just guessing really, based on what he said and what other people have said, he was contacted by Valve early on to make a mod for this specific function, for this brand new pay for mod system. So he asked if he could uh, ask permission from one of the people who, you know, a dependency was required. Uh, basically, they said no. The non-disclosure agreement was binding, so he wasn't allowed to ask permission before he made a mod. Well, that mod required FNIS, Forge New Idols in Skyrim. So, basically, what we ended up getting was a fishing minigame that used Forge New Idols to kind of had the fishing pole out, you know, where the character's fishing, but it didn't, uh, he didn't ask permission. And when you have a mod, that requires another mod. Apparently, if you want to have it up for pay, you gotta ask permission from the guy who it's dependent on. Good to know. And he found that out as his uh, fishing mod is now offline. So let us all drink to the fishing mod. We hardly knew ye. Okay, now Valve has been accused, and I say accused because nothing has been proven. But, uh, basically, they're removing uh, donation links, supposedly. Uh, again, it, we see evidence of that right here, but it's just a screenshot. And uh, it could be doctored, for all we know. We actually go to the page again. The person who put this up could have doctored the link. Uh, on the other hand, say the link is not doctored, there's a possibility that was just caught up in their anti-spam system. I know when I tried to put on my Steam profile, that's steamcommunity.com forward slash id forward slash Zarek, uh, I tried to put a bit.ly links. Uh, the system rejected it. It said, link removed for spam. So, uh, I, I don't know what's going on there. But uh, apparently people are under the impression that they cannot ask for donations. I personally don't think it's true. I think that it's either a misconception or an outright fraud. But if it is true, it is a seriously huge issue that needs to be addressed. It means that Valve sold out. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that they've got some contractual nonsense going on and they're just removing spam links. Uh, but uh, we'll see, we'll see. But honestly, the author of Four's New Idols in Skyrim being anti-pay uh, mod is completely understandable. And I think this perfectly illustrates Valve's failure to roll this system out properly. Instead of uh, easing people into the idea of paying for mods, you know, that are well developed, instead of uh, providing a system where the community votes on the mods they want, instead of making these hand-picked by Valve, you know, very specific few shining examples of modding, they just opened the floodgates. And the thing is, is that I can see the good intentions behind it, honestly. Uh, think about it. Uh, we're gonna add a way that these people can uh, support themselves, they were working for free, now they can put all their time into modding, it's gonna be great! Uh, without thinking about the other consequences, it's called not thinking it through, and it's something people, uh, especially myself, are very good at. But when a whole freaking company doesn't think it through, that's a failure! Because companies are usually made out of multiple people, so that you have no one single point of failure. Everyone checks each other's work. And that's how it should be. But I don't believe that uh, this occurred. I think Valve dropped the ball. I don't believe that they're trying to sell out or um, money monger. I believe that they honestly thought that they were supporting people, and they didn't think it through. So when they entered into a contract with Bethesda, because I'm almost certain it's a contract, I, I can't say for certain, I don't know the internal company politics between the two, but when they entered into a contract with Bethesda, they're basically stuck, and they can't undo what they did, as far as I know. 
And people are not happy. People are pissed off. What we've got is a community divided. Now, we have our three separate subsets of people. The issue with this is that they all have wildly different ideologies regarding this system. And I'm going to go through all three of them. So if you don't like what I'm saying, just wait a couple minutes and we'll get to the other people. And chances are you'll agree with one of their viewpoints. Now first, we have the legitimate professional developers. The people who put their lives out in order to make huge colossal mods like Wormstooth and Falscar. And people who are, uh, they aren't modders right now, but they certainly considered it and they're looking at getting into the modding scene now that they know that their work is going to pay off. And here's the deal. People with talent, real uh, college earned skills, don't earn those skills to give them away for free. They want to be successful in life. And people who are successful in life also manage their time well. Well guess what? Giving your skills away for free, spending hundreds and hundreds of man hours, is not using your time efficiently. But when you have a reward at the end of it, then all of a sudden, that time investment can switch over from a hobby where you'd only spend maybe a couple hours, you know, one or two hours a day on it, to something where you can actually justify in your mind spending eight to twelve hours a day to push out a large-scale professional quality project. And that's the idea, and it will attract those people who want to dedicate their life to making really awesome content using Bethesda's content creator. They want to make a job out of it in order to kickstart a career. These people who are unable to get development positions because they didn't have any experience, they can make this experience and still survive. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, that's not a real job, but uh, what have they been saying about YouTubers? That's not a real job. Look at uh, Total Biscuit, uh, Jim Sterling, Yahtzee, all these other people that I talk about all the freaking time. These are professionals, uh, more or less, that uh, make their living off of it. If you get enough money to survive, it is a real job. I'll tell you that right now. Doesn't matter if you're working at McDonald's. If you get enough money to survive, it's a real job. Keep in mind that, that unlike your average person who has a real job, these people actually end up with corporate profiles and uh, stock portfolios uh, because they invest their time well despite being a YouTuber. So just like the YouTubers, so too can mod makers be the exception to the rule. And the idea is, is if you have exceptional talent and you put in an exceptional amount of time, you too can be the exception to the rule, provided the stars have aligned properly, of course. Because you can have the best idea in the world and it's just ahead of its time, and you flop, and it, we've seen it happen all the time. Someone else picks up the idea and runs with it. So, not everyone can be successful, but everyone has the potential to be successful, provided they put in the time and effort. But I would love to be able to attract more people who can create content that is superior to Bethesda's DLCs, and I know they can do it because Bethesda's DLCs aren't that good. In fact, other than the engine, the game world itself, uh, Skyrim isn't a very good game, let's put it like this. Uh, the storyline is lacking. The writers of this generation are vastly inferior to the writers that came before. But the engine and the technology is vastly superior, so we have a trade-off, a divergence, and I believe that uh, uh, we can get some superior authors in here to write their own stories that can be played in Skyrim. Now keep in mind, these people are a vast minority, meaning that uh, I would have them, in my ideal world, be able to make pay-for mods with special restrictions. The second group are the anti-movement. What is the anti-movement? It is strictly against pay-for modding entirely. They believe that modding should be a hobby, mod modding should be done for free, no one should ever have to pay for a mod. And I understand that. I come from that culture originally. But, uh, at the same time, I'm looking for greater things, so I can't entirely agree with it, but I do understand it. And I believe 
just like they do, that all the, the stupid, like, horse armor DLC, or, you know, the Lambda suit, or all the other crappy, crappy little mods that uh, they want to nick you for, uh, you know, $1.99. Midas Magic Gold should be free. You know, all these little things should be free. Maybe something, like, huge, like, imagine if they made another Requiem that was even better than Requiem. Like, an overhaul to beat all overhauls. I would pay for that. But in terms of just, like, a little mod for Requiem, you know, that adds something? No. It, uh, again, a little house mod? No. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not equivalent to paying for a game. It's not worth paying for in DLC. But in general, not only have some developers come out against these pay-for mods, but pretty much all the users have, with a few rare exceptions. You'll see in the comments someone's like, Oh, I'm actually in support of it. Well, uh, there are the vast minority. The majority of people are opposed to this new system. Now, mods like Tamriel are rebuilt, uh, I mean, beyond Skyrim, and uh, the Rise of Manny Marco here, all have the same uh, call to arms on Reddit right now, where their authors are basically declaring that they will not charge a penny for their stuff. And for Beyond Skyrim, I actually understand it because they are a collaboration. Multiple uh, peoples coming together and uh, distributing the funds and making sure it was distributed accurately, making sure no one gets butt hurt over it, not having a legal battle. <laughs> uh, it's best to just go hands off with a large scale project like that. Uh, you know, it, it, assuming they didn't have this moral dilemma, uh, it would be a logistical nightmare for Beyond Skyrim to even consider uh, monetizing their project. But for smaller projects such as the Rise of Manny Marco here, uh, it won't be a consideration either. And not because of a logistical nightmare, but because of a moral stance they've chosen. And several other mod authors are coming out in the same way and making that distinction where their mod will always be free. And I saw a lot of smaller mod authors posting similar posts to various subreddits. And uh, I actually received a couple private messages and a YouTube comment saying that thank you for bringing this to my attention. I will be sure to... Uh, you know, make uh, sure all of my mods are free forever. And, and that's really cool. You know, uh, I'm fine with that. I'm also fine with the colossal DLC-sized mods being paid for. You know, it... There is a balance. But this is the single largest backlash in response to anything Valve has ever done in my memory. And I can remember back before Half-Life 1 existed, so... Yeah. And the reason is, is because this could potentially destroy the modding community if it's handled poorly. And unfortunately, I'll get into my Prophecy of Doom later on, where I'm basically going to tell you that it's going to be destroyed anyway, regardless of uh, what the community does. The term Indian Giver comes to mind if you want to look that up. It's not politically correct, but when have I given a shit about that, really? Now, what is pathetic and entirely unjustified is this bullshit posting of middle finger ASCII art. This childish practice is pathetic and it serves to change nothing other than someone basically taking a crap on another person's lawn. Congratulations, you are very likely going to get yourself uh, banned from the Steam community, which, you know, kind of sucks, but at the same time, uh, what can you do when uh, you're a dumbass, and you don't know how things work. If you remember the Bob is building an army to stop forced Google Plus integration, that shit was retarded as well. And what did it accomplish? Fuck all. When people posted that shit on my videos, I removed the comments because it was retarded. If you want to change people's minds, if you want to actually get something done, then post in proper English, post a well-worded dissent of what it is, and... Then copy-paste everywhere. No, I'm kidding. That, that shit's retarded as well. If you want to affect real change, I will explain it to you right now. And you're not going to like it. Find a petition with the maximum amount of signatures that is for the cause that you want. Make sure that the wording of it is exact to the way you want it. Then, go ahead and sign it yourself. When it has reached the uh, maximum capacity, when basically people have stopped signing it, that's when you want to go ahead and print it. 
And yes, it's going to take a lot of paper. You're going to need about 30,000 to 100,000 signatures to change anyone's mind. If you got less than 10,000 signatures, don't even bother. But the idea is, is that uh, the vast amount of paper and ink it takes is a small price to pay for actual change. What happens is you take that physical copy and you either send it or better yet deliver it in person to the per uh, party in question, like Valve for instance, and it causes a physical impact in the world. Uh, E-petitions don't have any physical impact, therefore they have no psychological force. People can just ignore them by not going to the page. If Kotaku posts an article, this petition made so many people, um, not going to have any force or effect. Force and effect are done in the world physically. Ideas need to be translated into physical force in order for them to change anything. Which brings me to the next thing. You need to organize a group of people who will call Valve every day. They need to tie up actual phone lines. But keep in mind, this is legitimate complaints, not harassment. You need to make a distinction because harassment is illegal, legitimate complaints is protected under our free speech. In other words, you complain until Valve t uh, just hangs up on you, then you uh, call them the next day and complain again until it's changed. But under no circumstances do you repeat call them, do you change your voice, do you change your phone number. Although, uh, if your phone happens to have a caller ID block on it, uh, I don't see any reason why that doesn't need to be on. Um, but in general, when you are taking up actual man hours of a company to post a legitimate complaint about what that company has done, th working within the law, you are actually affecting change because you are changing physical perceptions, along with delivering a 30,000 to 100,000 signature petition in person. When 30 or 40 people arrive with uh, petitions that big, you know, even if it's just the same petition, it creates a physical impact that has a physical ramification in the world. The people have to either look at this huge petition or dispose of the paperwork. Either way, disposing of all those papers, that's, uh, again, that's a physical task and it leaves a, an effect on the person's mind who's doing it. But people don't think about that. People just kind of uh, rally online and think it's actually going to change people's minds. And it won't. It... it Rallying online will foster ideas within the community of like-minded people, within the tribe of anti-pay-for mods. But under no circumstances will it cross the boundary line into the real world, because the real world has its own tribe and its own ideals. So you need to cross that boundary yourself and speak to them in their language. That's the difference between idealism and reality. And a lot of people don't understand that Idealism has a place in reality, it's just that it is not uh, on a soapbox. It is in action, and only through actions will one be recognized. And finally, the last step is obviously boycott all sales. Do not buy the shit that you are talking out against. And don't let your friends buy the shit that you're talking out against. Uh, it needs to be a tribal response, a chain reaction that basically renders their sales moot as if they uh, they just wasted money implementing this and that's probably not going to happen because at the end of the day everyone is selfish now you'll notice I take a more neutral stance because I can see both the good and the bad in this system and the potential for either one and if you signed the petition and then you did absolutely nothing else, you didn't call Bethesda, you didn't do anything else, but you said you did everything you could, and you believe in your heart that you did everything you could do, then congratulations on being part of the 99.9% .9 of humanity who are hypocrites. Yes, welcome to the club. Now the third group, the third group is very simple. They are scum. What am I saying by scum? All those people who post these terrible, terrible mods, uh, broken mods, mods that just don't function properly, and they try to sell them on the workshop 
in order to make a quick buck before their account gets banned, knowing that they have a proxy server, an alternate email address, and everything else, so that they can then go and post up another copy of it with a different description, different pictures, but it's still broken as shit. And this is quality control issues. Stealing other people's mods, but saying it's a better version of their mod. Things of that nature. These scum suckers will be prevalent in this new system unless uh, actions are taken to stop them. And unfortunately, Bethesda's uh, general reaction is you use the uh, copyright system to post a claim against them. And the idea about using the standard copyright system is that it's the same idea that YouTube uses, where if someone's, say, using Disney characters, well, then Disney can go ahead and post a copyright claim against them. In general, it is not a quick process, and it's definitely going to cause issues if the system is not refined and enhanced over time. Now, based on everything we've heard, the user who creates a mod is getting 25% of the funds. And then the rest of the funds are split between Valve and, uh, I was going to say Bethesda, but you know what I'm actually thinking. Now the truth, the truth that nobody wants to hear, is that when you create a mod with the mod tools that Bethesda provides, your mod is actually owned by Bethesda. It is their property to do with as they see fit. If they wanted to legally screw your ass, they could implement everything from your mod into the base game and not give you a single lick of credit. Kinda sucks, right? That's just the way the user agreement works and everyone agrees to it when they start using the tool. You see, in my head, uh, Bethesda is dead and it's being puppeted by uh, ZeniMax and basically ZeniMax it wants to be more like EA. And you know how we all fucking hate EA. Now as for this prophecy of doom, I am willing to bet all the money in my pockets against all the money in your pockets that this is a pilot program. And basically, the success or failure of this pilot program is going to govern what they do in the future. What they wanted to do is they want with Fallout 4 and uh, Elder Scrolls 6, assuming that ZeniMax ever gets over their fetish for MMOs, they want to create an infinite money well with that and it's not going to happen. They're going to implement this into their future games. You know it. And the idea is, is that Skyrim is an older game. If it creates a massive backlash, if people decide that uh, they don't want to play Skyrim anymore, if no one ever buys a single copy of Skyrim again, well, they've only broken down the community of an older game. There is less risk in an older game. When a new game comes out with a brand new advertising campaign and they say how it's better, it's nothing like the last one. It is enhanced and superior. Um, new and improved! <laughs> Basically, that uh, they'll be able to differentiate themselves from their failure assuming they do fail. However, if they're successful, then this will become the staple. And I believe and this is where the prophecy of doom comes in that Bethesda or as I personally call them puppet of Zenimax because I believe that the real Bethesda was gutted a long time ago and now uh, <laughs> well see for yourself uh, basically the issue is that uh, they're probably going to take the workshop and tie it more closely with the game. What I mean is, is that they're going to stop using plugin files. They're going to start using some kind of encrypted online authentication system. And this online authentication system is only going to allow your copy of the game to use authenticated mods. And authenticated mods would only come from the workshop. And they'd be tied to a single purchase key. The idea is, is that you would buy a mod and then you gain access to it in game. But under no circumstances would you be able to say go on the Nexus or go to <laughs> Lover's Lab and uh, install a third party mod? Those would basically not exist and they'd be against the terms of use. They would uh, see these third party mods as hacks, they would take them down. It would be the end of the modding community for Elder Scrolls 6 and uh, Fallout 4. They wouldn't exist. The existing modding community would only be like the Nexus would only work for Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. And then all the other games it works for right now, but none of the newer generation ones, because the newer generation ones will go to the bullshit system. 
I'm pretty sure that we're guinea pigs in this right now. That's what this is. Is it's a trial to see if they can basically uh, get away with this bullshit and then implement it full time with no options for the community. But basically, my prophecy as I have foreseen it, which is probably not very accurate, is that this shit is coming. And nothing we do is going to stop it unless we can become a nuisance and make it stink so bad that the Elder Scrolls and Fallout franchises uh, stink as well. And consumer confidence in the company drops. And when consumer confidence in the company drops, investor confidence in the company drops. When investor confidence in the company drops, stock prices drop. And when stock prices drop, then the bigwigs actually start listening. Until this all occurs, we are just pissing in the wind. And I'm the one who ends up stinking. I am not saying this will happen. I am saying that this could happen. I'm saying that I predict it'll happen. But, Bethesda could publish a uh, statement tomorrow saying, No, that's never going to happen. That guy's full of shit. And if they do that, and they're true to their word, then I will be happy. Regardless of being discredited, I will be content. A business is a business, and to make money is the hallmark of a business. And when one business makes more money than another business, that business up from up on high will find a way to smite their competition so they can take over its ruined husk and make even more money. And basically, Bethesda's got to make money, Valve's got to make money, business is business. I want to hear what you have to say, what you think about the, all of this, because, I mean, think about it. The Nexus could be taken down, all kinds of things could happen that we can't foresee right now. And I don't want any of it to happen, personally. I was happy before they implemented this bullshit. But uh, I can see the merits of it. I can see the horrible, horrible downsides. And I'm going to tell you right now, the downsides greatly outweigh the benefits. Because Patreon and other donation methods existed to pay authors before. The authors obviously had to ask for the money. And they weren't guaranteed the money, but they aren't guaranteed the money under this system either, so... This is just a clusterfuck, and it was unnecessary as hell. So, I'd like to hear what you guys have to think. Please go ahead and post a comment. Send me a private YouTube message. Like or dislike the video as you see fit, but if you've watched this far, I feel that you should press one of those two buttons. Now, other than that, I will be posting a separate rant on the bread release concept of a game where it's like sliced bread and it pisses me the fuck off but that'll be on my word of Zahakaran channel not related to this because I'm gonna try to keep this uh, regular more mainstream videos unless of course uh, someone else fucks up in the community in which case I do have to cover it because this is an issue that affects us all all of my character builds, my ultimate mod codex, my mod reviews, all of it is affected by this. So, post comments, like and dislike, subscribe if you want. I'll see y'all later. Well, holy crap, a last minute update. I set this thing to encode, and then I went off to lunch. I come back from lunch, and all of a sudden... The uh, creator of Frostfall's got this post on Reddit talking about how basically he uh, he got fucked by Valve. And uh, it's a very interesting story. I recommend reading it. Uh, it'll be in the video description below. And it's just something to check out because, uh, yeah, you almost feel bad for the guy. Um, obviously, it's to be taken with a grain of salt because you can't trust everything everyone says on the internet. But I do very much believe he probably got screwed over. Um, his Reddit and Twitter accounts are gone. And his content has been pulled from the workshop. I believe that uh, the Nexus is probably going to go next. So, we'll see y'all later. You have a good one.